Okay, Najib, what do you think? Should we enlarge? Do you think we should get started? Yeah, maybe, maybe we should. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. This is the inaugural lecture of our Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion program. And it uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, special event today. Just wanted to say a few words about EDI in the Department of Surgery. And um, it's a program that was uh, initially set up in part because of the behest from the Dean of the University, Dean Trevor Young, but also because several faculty in the Department of Surgery were very interested in elevating the stature of EDI um, priorities within surgery. So we were very delighted to start the program and it gives me great pleasure also to thank uh, Laura Snell and Najib Safiuddin who are on the line, who are serving as our co-directors in EDI. And in a moment, I'll ask them to introduce our guest speaker. But I think you'll all agree that this is a, a challenging time in the world in, in response to world events, such things as, you know, the pandemic, uh, U.S. election uh, results, uh, the anti-Black racism, and so many things that are going on in the world. We thought it would be very timely to um, start this uh, program with this particular lecture. So uh, thanks to Najib and Laura for organizing this, and I'll turn it over to Najib now, who will introduce our guest speaker, uh, Professor Francis Henry. Najib. Good afternoon, everyone. And again, on my behalf and uh, Laura's behalf as co-directors, we want to welcome you and thank you for joining us. It is really a, a delight for us to uh, introduce and welcome Dr. Henry to this inaugural uh, talk. Dr. Henry is a professor emerita of York University. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. She is really one of the foremost and leading experts on racism and anti-racism in this country. She has authored and co-authored many publications and books. The last of which I would specifically mention is called The Equity Myth, Racialization and Indigeneity in Academia in Canada. And so I highly recommend that anybody who's interested in the subject and wants to look at evidence-based uh, research that's qualitative and quantitative about this issue that we all live within and deal with and want to confront to really uh, read the book. Uh, Dr. Henry was uh, gracious enough to give her her time today. Um, before I turn the mic to her, I would just want to again remind you to please mute your mics. The format of this lecture is slightly different from what we're used to normally. We'll have two parts to it. The first part will be about white privilege and, and, and unconscious bias and the history of that and some other ramifications to it that Dr. Henry, Henry will speak to in the first 15 minutes or so. We'll then have about a 15 minute period of time for discussion. We want this to be very interactive and, uh, and back and forth. Please use the texting or raise your hand or unmute and speak if you wanted to. Uh, the next 15 minutes will be another part to this lecture, which will relate to current work that Dr. Henry and her co-investigators are working on related to COVID racialized communities in this city and in this region, uh, which is very uh, timely, of course. And then we'll have another period of time to also discuss and comment. So I uh, hope you enjoyed the talk and please uh, participate uh, and, uh, and we look forward to your questions. So Dr. Henry, please go ahead. Well, yes, thank you, Najib. I'm really very honored by this um, invitation because, you know, as an ordinary member of the public, I am usually the recipient of your kind of services and have been now and again. And I have never really been able to uh, provide whatever service I can to this August group of doctors. So I'm, uh, this is a first for me. So I'm really uh, quite thrilled about it. Let me just say, I should have informed you, I've made a slight uh, change in the order of what I'll be speaking about. It occurred to me that I should really sort of start from the beginning and to talk about racism and anti-racism first before going into the specifics of uh, the particular areas of unconscious bias and white privilege. So let me begin by just making a few comments about racism, that most Canadians do not consider themselves to be racist. In fact, they are often quick to deny their racism and also that of the society at large. <clears throat> 
racist acts are physical acts according to much general belief. Racism is understood to be overt or physical in nature. So that we get physical acts of violence against racialized people or created incidents such as assaults and so on. And these, because they're overt and obvious, can readily be understood as racial in nature. In fact, however, racism has many covert and often subtle ways of expressing itself. And one of the objectives of people currently working in this area is to expose the myriad ways in which racism is formed and expressed in Canadian society. To begin, racism is a complex aspect of human behavior. It can be broken down into three major components, individual, institutional or systemic, and cultural ideological. With respect to individual behavior, a distinction must be made between attitudinal and behavioral. For example, an individual might have a set of beliefs or attitudes towards black people, that they are lazy, or they are slow, or they have criminal tendencies. But these attitudes may not always lead to discriminatory behavior, perhaps because the opportunity to actually discriminate does not arise. However, negative or even hostile attitudes may translate into what is called everyday racism or microaggressions such as refusing to shake hands or not sitting next to a racialized person on a bus or a train. Institutional or systemic racism refers to the policies and practices within groups or organizations which are intentionally and often unintentionally discriminatory. The former height and weight requirements for police officers, for example, discriminated not only against women, but also certain ethno-racial groups who are smaller in physical size. Now, how does one explain racism? Why racism? Uh, there have been very many long-standing discussions and debates on race and racism for example, uh, the relationship of race and class. Many scholars believe that the outgrowth of capitalism is racism and that there is a close relationship between the two because capitalism requires labor which sets up social classes. More recently, the concept of intersectionality posits that several social categorizations, such as race, class, gender, sexual orientation, etc., and others may apply to a given individual or group. These are overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. And this theory has gained particular po uh, popularity because it brings together many possible variables that interact to bar certain people from employment or other desired amenities of life in a modern society. The term structural racism refers to all the major social forces, ideologies and processes that interact with each other to create and maintain inequities between social, racial, and ethnic groups. Structural racism operates at a societal social level. It goes beyond the inequities that take place at the individual, and it does not depend on the actions of individuals to maintain itself. Examples of structural racism include social and geographic segregation, as an example. Now, systemic racism is the one that we are most often familiar with. It's often called institutional racism. <clears throat> and it refers to the policies, the practices, 
and the norms that govern the institutions of society, such as our justice system, our educational systems, our employment organizations, etc. These policies set the standards, behaviors, and values of these systems. The problem is that many of the systems have been in place for many years and generations were established by primarily white populations which settled this country and others. Thus, they are already embedded in a value system which precludes non-white or racialized people. Systemic racism looks at larger structural and institutional operations rather than individual behaviors. Now, these systems are built with an already ingrained bias, a racist lens embedded with a discriminatory lens that doesn't provide or allow for equal or fair opportunities for racialized peoples to succeed within. Most indigenous and black people are stigmatized and disadvantaged at every turn by systemic racism. Uh, <clears throat> now, if we move on to um, unconscious bias, well, what do we mean by that? It, this operates uh, in, in, in a way that is very poorly understood um, because it means that we are now looking at areas of behavior and of attitudes that are unconscious in nature. Experiences of discrimination and other forms of racism now can be understood through an unconscious bias. These result from our experiences in growing up, learning, living life, meeting, and interacting with people. And we unconsciously absorb biases which become part of our thinking, but not necessarily our actions. Even when people think that they are open-minded and fair because they do not accept or even believe in overt racist actions, they may nevertheless be influenced by their unconscious thoughts and biases. Nowhere is this more evident than in the employment arena and particularly the hiring process. In the workplace, unconscious bias may look like a hiring process that favors applicants from say first world developed countries with similar educational backgrounds, social activities that favor those. Um, and uh, in other words, they share a value system um, with each other. And uh, it's a subtle form of bias uh, and it supports particular outcomes which repeats themselves. And this remains, and this is I think the critical point, because these actions are repeated and because they are, um, uh, are structured by unconscious thoughts, these unconscious thoughts remain unquestioned and adopted into policy and practice and therefore produce discriminatory practices in the operation of an organization. So if unchecked, unconscious bias contributes to inequality for many different groups, both within and outside of organizations for example, by gender, indigeneity, age, language, sexual orientation, geographic location, disability, etc. Unconscious bias can undermine the goals of equity, inclusiveness, and respect for diversity in many different uh, organizational and institutional contexts. What we now know is that the unconscious bias that forms policies and practices need to be challenged. 
because many of them maintain inequity and unfairness. Now, if we come to the other main pillar of modern analysis of a particular kind of racism, and that is um, white privilege. Now, what we're discussing here is white privilege, even white supremacy, and the general power of whiteness. Now, the phrase white privilege was coined by Peggy McIntosh, uh, sort of uh, fairly leftist leaning feminist in the United States in 1989. And she published an article called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. White privilege refers to a privilege which puts me at an advantage, she noted. She asked herself an important question that inspired her famous essay. Quote, on a daily basis, what do I have that I didn't earn? Our work should include asking the two looming follow-up questions. Who built this system and who keeps it going? Further, she says, I think whites are carefully taught not to recognize white privilege, as men are taught not to recognize male privilege. So I have begun, she writes, in an untutored way to ask what is it like to have white privilege? And I have come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets that I can count on cashing in each day, but without which I was meant to remain oblivious. White privilege is like an invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. She cites many examples of white privilege, which we are often not even aware of. Here are some examples. I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. I can avoid spending time with people whom I was trained to mistrust and who have learned to mistrust my kind or me. If I should need to move, I can be pretty sure of renting or purchasing housing in an area which I can afford and in which I would want to live. I can be pretty sure that my neighbors in such a location will be neutral or pleasant to me. I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. I can turn on the television or open the front page of the newspaper and see people of my race widely represented. In effect, white privilege means having greater access to power and resources than people of color do in the same situation. And one of the most obvious examples of white privilege is the ability to accumulate wealth, a privilege created by overt systemic racism in both the public and private sectors of society. It must also be noted that many white people do not enjoy the privileges that come with relative affluence such even as food security. Many do not experience the privilege that comes with access, such as to nearby hospitals. It does not assume that everything a white person does is unearned or unmerited, but rather that as a built-in advantage and what they do is assumed to be normal. <clears throat> 
if white privilege is having greater access to power and act and resources than people of color in the same situation. Uh, so this is really the driving force um, to the differential status of whites with their privilege. And it's demonstrated in many ways, even aside from wealth, white people are less likely to be interrogated by the police, are subject to police uh, and are not subject to police harassment. In general, the criminal justice system treats them, treats um, people of color more harshly than it does whites. And why mention these issues in an article defining white privilege? Well, because of the past and present context of wealth inequality, which serves as a perfect example of white privilege. Privilege also refers to laws that impact individuals. And many countries, including our own, have a history of laws that explicitly targeted racial minorities to keep them out of the country or out of neighborhoods and deny them access to wealth and the services white people are entitled to. White privilege defines access to wealth and therefore the ability to perpetuate systems of discrimination. White people become more likely to move through the world with an expectation that their needs can readily be met. People of color, on the other hand, move through the world knowing their needs are on the margins. White privilege was and still being created and maintained through the power of systemic racism. Simply put, white privilege is that hidden, undescribed, and often unconscious sense of being able to live and experience life without harassment or discrimination because of race, color of skin, gender, etc. Although white women experience white privilege, they have nevertheless experienced male privilege, which of course includes gender. I want to conclude this section on white privilege with the following comment, which I think is uh, uh, rather almost scary. In recent terms, the term white privilege has slowly been turned into white supremacy increasingly used in the media and the public agenda. It seems to appeal to people because it presents a more accurate way of describing today's realities. The use of the term was prominently used by uh, scholars named Delgado and Bell in a seminal work in which they promoted a new theory called critical race theory. And they noted that white supremacy and racism were outstanding features of American life. But of course, this is not to say that it is totally absent in Canadian life or in the life of other countries. And they also described systemic and individual racism as almost secondary to the supremacy that is embedded in culture. Um, Nahisi Coates, a very famous now um, black author in the United States, wrote essays and later several books in which the notion of white supremacy was used to describe all the forms of racism experienced by blacks in the US and elsewhere. And where white supremacy was in earlier times, used to describe the, the Triple K, the Ku Klux Klan in the Southern United States and other hotheads. And today, white supremacy is almost a fundamental sort of recognized force in American society. And it is this, and of course we are very close in terms of American society and values, 
Uh, and it is this notion of, of privilege turned into supremacy, which is um, related to uh, a history of violence uh, against people of color, particularly blacks, of course, which I find um, most scary. So let me stop at this point and uh, perhaps see if there are any uh, commentaries or questions, if that's all right. Thank you very much for that introduction and that review of white privilege. I, I have a question, if that's okay, Najib. I'm just gonna jump in first. Um, so Dr. Henry, we've, we've read your book, um, The Equity Myth, and hopefully will inspire some other people to read it. But in the book, you talk about systemic racism being embedded particularly in Canadian universities and Canadian academic institutions. And so um, all of us here, of course, are uh, part of U of T or many of us, I would assume all of us. And we're really, you know, interested here in what your thoughts are, particularly on how you feel racism is embedded in the University of Toronto or in our academic institution, and in particular in medicine, and what your views are on that, and maybe a couple, you know, things that jump out at you that um, messages for us or things that we could potentially uh, start in terms of trying to tackle some of these systemic racism issues in our institution. Yes, well, uh, thank you for that um, question. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk to that uh, because, of course, I spent uh, quite a long time with other colleagues researching in, in the field of racism at the university. Um, and, and let me say at the outset that there are several universities in this country at the moment who are pioneering uh, a new look and new action um, in, in the way in which universities, Canadian universities are structured. And I'm happy to say that the University of Toronto is one of them. And um, the University of British Columbia, I, in my view, is the other. These are institutions that are at the forefront of finally recognizing the issues of racism in their own systems and beginning how be it slowly uh, to create systems of change, particularly in, in uh, structural uh, kinds of, um, of ways. But what our research uncovered, of course, is that for the most part, there are at least, well, there are a number of major issues, but one of them is representation. Uh, no university in this country has an adequate um, number of people of different diversities in the teaching faculty. Um, and that means therefore that, that, that the numbers game representation is one of the key issues that needs to be looked at. Um, secondly, the issue of once you have people who are diverse um, in the system, they, they do need to be given some special attention. One of the things we found, for example, is that racialized faculty complained that when they are indeed hired, they're not mentored. There is very little attention paid to make, making them comfortable in the new environment. Um, we also discovered that there is vast differences in, in uh, things like promotion and tenure where racialized faculty are far slower to be promoted. And there are far fewer who were promoted, uh, say, to the rank of, of full professor during the time that we engaged in our um, research. There are a whole myriad of ways in which um, faculty of color uh, and particularly black faculty felt that they were treated as outsiders, as never one of the family. And um, this of course led to, well, it, it led to despondency. And in some instances, it certainly led to physical problems uh, and the need for mental health treatment and the like. Um, the second major point I think that 
we discovered uh, is that the university will not change, or in fact, you could say no organization will really change unless there is commitment from the top. And in, in the uh, academic field, that means the president. Uh, one must have a very strong commitment from the top leadership. And that means more than just picking on a person of color and giving them an assistant vice principal job of equity uh, in a hierarchy that we know, an administrative hierarchy that is, is uh, well, that is very, very powerful. And where, where equity really falls at the bottom of the heap. And that is another one of our major findings that almost every university we looked at had an equity office, a human rights office, a human relations office, titles varied, although now I think the common term is equity, but they were powerless. They were powerless in the university system. And so they could write reports and do whatever, but they were paid very little attention. So there are key areas in the university where racism has to be confronted and it has to be accepted that when people are treated differently to their colleagues and because of the fact that they are not white, uh, well, action really must be taken. And not only because of the principle of the thing, but because increasingly our societies are diverse. The student bodies are diverse. And if students don't see themselves there teaching, uh, well, that's, that's certainly not, not a good academic environment. So, uh, but I think the, the good thing is, despite the fact that it's very difficult to change an academic facility whose history goes back to the Middle Ages, uh, it, uh, nevertheless, it's becoming very, very apparent that some of our universities are paying a great deal more attention and we can expect hopefully in the next years to see some structural change as well as just commitment to action. I know that's probably a very long answer, but. That was great, yeah. thank you. Maybe I'll relay a question from the chat line and a follow up question to what you had uh, spoken about. Uh, somebody had asked, how can health workers in, in their clinical setting recognize and be aware of uh, privilege, white privilege? Uh, would you be able to address that? I know you don't work in a clinical setting, but maybe you, uh, you can shed some light on it. Well, um, I, I find that really rather difficult um, to answer because I haven't had that experience either personally or in research terms. But um, I, I think the important thing for health workers of all kinds is to make a patient, a, a person of color aware that they are being treated equally, fairly, warmly, and with the best attention to their needs and, and the best ways of treating whatever ails them. Uh, that it must be made clear to a person that they are um, as welcome as everybody else is and that every human being on earth has a human right to good um, medical, has a human right to um, medical care. Uh, so displaying that difference, uh, that um, attention to difference in a warm, compatible manner, in a friendly manner, um, I think is probably crucial, particularly in a health situation where people are distraught, they're worried, they're anxious uh, that their health is involved. They have to be treated as, as uh, companionably as possible. I mean, that at least um, is, is my opinion on, on the subject, but I, I, I think the relationship between health worker and patient, uh, as far as I know, has been poorly researched. 
Thank you. There's a question. Uh, I think somebody has their hand up. Uh, Mohammed Salihab, can you unmute yourself, please, and go ahead and ask the question? Hi there. Um, thanks so much for for the talk. I'm from the University Health Network. Um, I'm just reflecting on. On would be appreciated, given that you're asking the question, but that's okay if you. Sure. Um, thanks. So I'm I'm just reflecting on your comments um, earlier around sort of white privilege and sort of the, the link or the transition in our language and our choice points around language with white supremacy and and just practically in terms of overall engagement um, in this dialogue. Um, do you have any accounts or can you can you comment on how language around white privilege impacts allyship or impacts engagement in the conversation? One of the things that I find I'm noticing in social circles and to some degree in varying professional circles, there's um, a risk of disengaging um, individuals who might identify as white um, by virtue of some of the language that we're using, fear of feeling that they can um, have something uh, valuable to contribute because of their white privilege or what's perceived to be white privilege. So, so wondering if you can shed some light on that and, and how we sort of strike that balance in the dialogue and engagement. You mean, um... I, I'm not sure I quite understand your question. Uh, are, are you talking about the language that that white people use in relationship uh, to non-white people? No, I think I I'm I'm referring to um, I'm referring to the weight that words like white privilege and white supremacy have. Um, and how it impacts people who are white um, from engaging fully in the conversation. Oh, oh I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I get it. Um, it's a very interesting um, uh, question. Uh, for the most part, uh, there are a lot of responses to, to phrases like that. One is denial. Uh, one of the things that um, my former colleague, Carol Tatter, and I uh, found in our studies of various institutional areas of racism is that the first response of white people is denial. I am not a, a racist. I don't do racist things. Um, in other words, there is a total lack of understanding of what uh, racialized people have gone through in their lives, in their histories, and particularly when they've come to a new country um, as, as migrants or as refugees and, and are treated um, unfairly and, and discriminatorily. So I, I think the first reaction is that they use, they use the language of denial and uh, when, uh, well, with some more interaction or perhaps with some training or some courses, uh, people slowly perhaps begin to realize that maybe there is a problem in terms of the unfair treatment of certain people in, in our society and that that should be stopped. Uh, so that they stop using denial language and become a little bit more accepting. That is, that, that's a good result. And we, I think, sometimes um, have seen that. Um, I think also that when you use terminology like, um, um, well, like white supremacy, I think that's very threatening to white people. And uh, therefore, one has to be very circumspect about using such language. It's more common in the US because things are, are as you know, more blatant and more open in the United States. But it'll, it is slowly creeping into Canada as well that we have to be careful about the language we use. Um, that um, not only shouldn't we say, you know, the N word, for example, which is still still being debated at universities and a variety of places, um, but in general, we need to be careful about not using over radical language and frightening people. So um, that's about my thoughts on that question, but it's an extremely interesting one. <laughs> 
So just for the interest of time, there's one more question from one of the uh, audience and I have a follow-up, but maybe we'll address that after your next part. But this question quickly from Colin, who's asking, you know, you've spoken of the importance of support for equity from the top. In your research, how important is it to examine the role of hierarchical university structures themselves in contributing to these forms of oppression and inequity? Yes, well, uh, obviously that is, um... That is one of the main areas to start with. That hierarchy was formed, you know, 500 years ago, and we're still saddled with it now. Uh, and it seems to me and other people who have looked at this, uh, that uh, a university should be governed uh, in an equitable manner. And when you have, as you have administrative hierarchies that we have now, uh, there are differences in terms of, of the power structure. And, and it's who has the power, you know, who, who makes the major decisions. So uh, changing that hierarchy uh, into something that is a, a bit more um, equitable and uh, that depends more on community action rather than just personal action it is probably a good place to begin. Uh, I think several universities have tried to minimize that hierarchical structure, but it, but it is there. So uh, Dr. Henry, just for the interest of time, maybe we'll move on to the next part you want to speak about and then uh, leave some further questions till the end, if that's okay, about your recent work on COVID and racialized communities in the, in the region. Um, yes. Um, there's also, uh, I was going to move on to what you asked me to look at in particular or to think about was meritocracy. And, and so let me go there briefly, uh, because I found that a very interesting point. You know, the, the fact that um, there is when, uh, particularly in terms of hiring uh, new faculty, new staff, whatever, there is the question of, of, of merit, that you have to hire by merit in order to get the best person. And um, often that discriminates that kind of approach discriminates against people who are seen not to be meritorious, even to begin with, no matter what their training um, has been. Um, but meritocracy is a very interesting uh, concept because it actually began very well. It began as a good thing, uh, that it is based on the idea that a company or an organization evaluates people on their skills, their abilities and merit without consideration of their gender, race, sexuality, et cetera. Um, and therefore it was started uh, as a, a, a way of getting the best people. And the reason for that was that all the, the tough high jobs in society were, were being held by people of what was then called breed, breeding. You know, they came from the elite families and they restructured themselves constantly. And so that we had uh, an elite class of, of organizers and managers uh, who, uh, who just kept hiring people like themselves. And the result of that is that people who were diverse are, are cut out of the competition. And so that the idea of meritocracy is a good one because it tries, um, it tries to uh, broaden the scope of, of application. You don't have to be born into a rich, wealthy family in order to attain the skills necessary for whatever job you want to um, apply to. So it has a very good beginning. However, it has now been used frequently as a way of, um, of uh, hiring. Well, you can't hire people like that. You can't put quotas in place, for example, because quotas are, are unfair and quotas are themselves discriminatory. Um, 
which is not necessarily true. If done the right way, quotas can be very beneficial. But um, th the whole point really of going back and sticking to an old outdated method of maintaining the, and, and constantly maintaining the elite structure of society really doesn't work anymore when you have growing complexity and diversity um, in, in, um, in, in a country. So um, just because you're looking for people of um, indigenous or racialized background does not mean that you hire inferior people because there are many, many, we have ample evidence of that, of people who are skilled and trained, uh, who come from diverse backgrounds, who come from poor underprivileged backgrounds, from poor countries, et cetera, who have precisely the skills that you need in whatever the, the job is. So it's not true to say that hiring uh, is that if you have a quota or even if you have an unofficial quota by a, a preference, um, it does not mean you, you have to hire inferior people uh, because there are lots of very, very good people out there. So I, I found that, that whole comment, you know, that, that was made very interesting because it never even occurs to me that there is still the idea of merit and elitism really going on and that that in itself is a form of, of disadvantage. So we can take a break there, I think, for any more comments or questions. That's all right. If not, um, I can just make a few comments of the work I've been recently involved in, uh, which is through the um, a Royal Society of Canada, of which I'm a member, uh, they began a task force on, on COVID uh, and the effects of, of the virus on uh, all kinds of, of areas of society. And with a little bit of prodding from me, um, I also suggested that uh, we have a, to do some work on COVID's relationship to racialized communities. And that's what I've been working on now for the last oh, five or six months. And uh, we uh, sort of collected a, a group of scholars, um, primarily, but not exclusively, Black scholars, uh, who are working precisely on how uh, the pandemic is negatively affecting uh, racialized communities. And what we have found, and, and this has been found in every country uh, where, where the uh, pandemic has struck, uh, it was first noticed by English scholars in England that Black and South Asian affected um, diseased people, uh, first of all, that their numbers were stronger, and secondly, that they were hospitalized more frequently and thirdly, that there were more deaths proportionate to their numbers in the population from the uh, uh, COVID disease. Um, we here in Toronto and in Canada generally were somewhat slower to recognize that racialized communities, primarily because of, of their social relationship with the rest of society, has also been negatively um, um, affected uh, more than their proportionate numbers um, in, in, in society. And in the city of Toronto, for example, we now know quite definitively that the Northwest section of the, of, of, of the um, area, uh, where, which has the highest proportion of black South Asian um, peoples, also has one of the highest rates of infection. And it's not because they're uh, racialized, it, it's nothing to do with their genes, nor of their uh, prior medical conditions. It has to do with their societal living conditions, their segregation, um, living in multi-generational homes, being crowded together, using public trans, um, transport, 
and so on, and above all, having the need to work, that they cannot work from home. You know, healthcare workers cannot do their job at home. Uh, and there are many uh, areas of employment like that. And, and these are jobs that are held by racialized people. So their numbers are higher than, than should be for societal reasons, not because of, of, uh, of their race or their genetics. Uh, and that, of course, it used to be a real problem that it was thought to be that inferiority was a genetically caused condition uh, and so on. So um, this is sort of what I've been doing recently. And there are quite a number of um, scholars that are engaged in this sort of work. And there are several very important research projects that have started on the effects of COVID on racialized people and, and their communities. Thank you. Uh, unless there are other questions about this specific issue, there was a question from the previous topic that maybe I could raise as a final question because of time. So, okay. Um, Amr al-Maragi has asked whether you think uh, having initial anonymized application forms for certain positions at the university would be a reasonable place to start, a reasonable strategy to take to, to try to minimize the bias? Is that something, I mean, first of all, there's a practicality of it, of course, but as a concept, is that something would be useful? Do you know of any places that use it as organizations? Um, I think it would be useful, but it's very hard to, it's very hard to make a person's background anonymous uh, because uh, certainly for academic positions uh, and, and for quite a number of high level positions, important positions, uh, of course one needs uh, a resume, uh, a CV. And there are always clues as to who a person is. Uh, name is an obvious clue. Um, uh, places of where one is studied is, is an obvious uh, clue and so on. So I think in practical terms, it's difficult to do. Um, and I'm not sure, uh, the only example that I know of uh, which try to make hiring totally anonymous is in the musical world. Uh, a, a number of orchestras around the world, classical symphony orchestras use that technique of blind auditions so that when they were hiring a new orchestra player, they had that, uh, they, they had a partition and uh, they were never seen. They were only heard because of course they were playing an instrument. Uh, and uh, that technique did promote uh, some new hires of people who were came from diverse backgrounds. But it's also been criticized because, well, for lots of reasons. Um, some musicians said, well, all I had to do was hear X and I knew exactly who he was. In other words, their familiarity with the, uh, with the dynamics of, of playing an instrument was so great that the person could be identified simply from the sound they were making out of a violin or something of that sort. So I, I think in theory, it, it could be useful. In practice, I have my doubts. Uh, maybe one last question, if you can oblige. Uh, Andrew had raised the issue of, if we are starting a policy of EDI in Toronto and given the changes in the city, is there any empirical evidence as to how long it would take for us to see that change to some degree manifested within the academy at U of T, for example? Well, I think one obvious thing you would see fairly quickly is if you do it a head count, the number count, to see if, if the whole area of, um, of representation is changing. And it is, the numbers are going up, but very slowly. So, uh, I mean, it's years, uh, presumably, not, not a short while. It is, it is years because universities aren't um, in a position of doing a lot of hiring. So, you know, the numbers are defined in terms of need and money and so on. 
so it, it becomes it would it would take a while but it um, it nevertheless it shows promise if the numbers of representatives for example the statistics we collected in our research our research was done in 2015 216 let's say we do that now i think now we would see a rise in numbers it wouldn't be huge but it would be there so uh i i think you know that that is an approach certainly that needs to be to be looked at but in the end it comes down to how much is diversity promoted from the top? Well, there are many good questions still, but I think I'm afraid we're running out of time and I'm being prompted to have to end the, you know, the lecture on time. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for all of you for attending and for all the good questions and engagement. Uh, I, do, I really do wish we had more time because there are many valuable questions that should be addressed. Uh, uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you again, and I hope this was valuable. I'm not sure if Dr. Ratka, you wanted to uh, say anything? No, just thanks to you, Najib, and thanks to Laura. A special thanks to Professor Henry. Uh, we'll be doing this again. Uh, this is the inaugural lecture. There'll be many more to follow. Thanks, all. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Actually, I would add one thing quickly. Please, if you do have suggestions or questions, do reach out to me and Laura. We are doing this as part of all of us. So all your questions can be directed to us and we hope to be able to answer them. Maybe you get involved. Uh, please do so.